and welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple-making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We are absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, we welcome Joanne Rectine and Trish McMillan to the show. Joanne Rectine, CSAT, CPDTKA, FDN, MS, MPH, RN. Joanne has been working with dogs professionally for over 20 years and specializes in separation anxiety work. Joanne is a certified separation anxiety trainer. She is the owner and founder of the Loose Leash Academy and works exclusively with dogs who experience separation anxiety or isolation distress issues and uses humane and studied protocols that are formulated specifically for a dog's needs. She is also a certified professional dog trainer through the Certification Council of Professional Dog Trainers, a certified family dog mediator, and a fear-free certified trainer. Joanne currently organizes educational events for dog training professionals in subjects like dog aggression, nose work, and separation anxiety. She is an expert at organizing events and has planned everything from one-hour seminars to multiple-day international conferences. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, welcome to Trish McMillan as well. And I'm just going to say that uh, we have shortened her bio significantly here, but I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with Trish. Trish McMillan holds a master's degree in animal behavior from the University of Exeter in England, and numerous other certifications and credentials. She specializes in training and behavior modification work using positive reinforcement with dogs, cats, horses. Um, Trish holds many other certifications and credentials as well. She has a significant background in sheltering and all different kinds of animal work, and she currently runs Macmillan Animal Behavior in North Carolina and shelters Behavior Hub online and worldwide. Welcome, Trish. Thanks for inviting me to talk. You're welcome. I am honored that you are both here with me today. So thank you all for for taking time to come and share with all of us today. And I just want to, before we get started today, I'm sure the listeners have noticed that the format is probably going to be a little bit different today. And with, along with that, I wanted to offer up a bit of a trigger warning before we start today. In addition to having two ATA members as guests today and modifying the format a bit, we will be discussing a sensitive emotional and important topic today. We'll be talking about behavioral euthanasia and our guests will be sharing from both personal and professional experiences. This is an important topic and something that many people who live and or work with animals have had to deal with, had to experience, or will have experience with at some point. However, I also recognize that this might be a topic that not everybody is in a place to listen to right now. And so we wanted to give everybody the the warning that that was what we're going to be talking about today in case um, somebody is not in a position to listen to that today. So I would really like to thank both of our guests for being incredibly brave and vulnerable to come on the show and share with us about this topic today. 
With all of that being said, Joanne, I know that you have recently gone through this difficult process and everything that it entails. If it's all right with you, I'd like to invite you now to share with us about your story, uh, about the process that you went through that led you to make the decision that you did and about the um, how that's shaped your life and the changes that have happened as a result of that. Sure. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, before I get started talking about the, the individual dog that we're going to speak about today, I just want to say that I'm speaking to it, to this topic um, from both the aspect of being a pet professional, trainer, behavior, I work with behavior cases, and as a pet parent. Um, and my, the lenses I wear for it, pet parent, dog professional, and also I'm a retired nurse practitioner. So I've got that medical background and that'll play into what I'm going to tell you guys and how it's how it has affected me. So the dog we're, we're talking about today, um, her name was Elka and Elka was euthanized in December at the age of five and a half. And as you can imagine, when it's a relatively, and I'm using the term relatively, um, physically healthy dog at that at a youngish age, it's really, really difficult. And I hope that um, by Trish and I talking about this topic today, that we'll be able to open the door for others to be able to talk about it and talk about it a bit more freely and not feel as much shame or isolation when you have to go through this, because it's hard. It's just flat out hard. Um, very, very hard. Okay, so let's go back. So Elka came to live with us um, when she was probably about six months old. She was found as a stray wandering the streets of Tampa. We have no idea, of course, what her backstory was. When she came to us, um, she was rather emaciated and she um, suffered greatly with separation, distress type issues. Um, those at that point, those were pretty much the the two big things that we worried mostly about. And I like to say that by the time she she did pass away, she was a recovering SA dog. And yeah, Elka is the reason that I am a CSAT because I kind of knew what to do with her. But she it was such a severe case, such a severe case that I knew I needed to study more. And thus, I studied with Milena De Martini and became a CSAT. Learned more about it so that I could help other animals. Um, so as Elka progressed in age, when she reached adolescence, we noticed some issues that um, that started to creep in. We have another dog, a standard poodle, who is nine. So he was five-ish, four-ish, four-ish at that point. Um, and we noticed that Elka was, number one, she was a resource guarder. And number two, she t was starting to turn into a bit of a bully with the poodle and just not being very nice to him and just kind of beating up on him a little bit. So we employed some management techniques, started doing that kind of stuff and just thought, you know, you kind of think they're young. Let's see what sh shakes out. Even as a trainer, you still go with, it's going to be okay. We're going to work our way through this. Um, it's just growing pains, two dogs getting to know each other, all of that. Well, that really wasn't the case and things started to get worse. Um, and we ended up employing more management techniques to keep them separated. But it would seem like there would be really, really good days and we didn't have to worry about the management stuff. And then there were really, really crappy days where we had we really had to worry about the management and make sure that Gibbs wasn't getting harmed and that Elka did not have the opportunity to practice the behavior um, where she could snark at Gibbs, be mean to Gibbs, and basically attack him and beat up on him. And mind you, in the whole time of Elka's life, we never had an incident where anyone was maimed physically or harmed, no bites to humans, no, no overt bites to other dogs, just a lot, a lot of snarking and a lot of um, the other dog feeling very uncomfortable in his own home and never knowing when the wrath of Elka was going to come upon him. It was almost like we all walked around eggshells in our own house. Um, in addition to that kind of stuff, physically, we had, um, since Elka was a German Shepherd, we had her hips x-rayed when she was spayed at 14 months, and she had very severe bilateral um, hip dysplasia on, on both legs. So this animal was in pain 
a fair, fair amount of the time. And we all know that pain can play into behavior and it does affect both behavior and the quality of life for the animal. So she was just, she was just kind of a, a miserable puppy. And then um, she was afraid to go outside some of the time. She didn't want to ride in the car. Just was an uncomfortable and worried girl most of her life. So her quality of life was really affected. When she was about three, um, there was an incident where she, I was sitting in a chair. She put her paws up on my on my lap and she was um, she wanted to get my attention and I was working at my computer like I always do. And I wasn't Clearly, I wasn't responding the way she wanted me to. And she actually put her teeth on my face. And she had great, great, great bite inhibition, no harm. But yeah, that scared me like nothing's ever scared me um, when dealing with a dog. So at that point, I, even I knew it was time to get in the help of a veterinary behaviorist. Um, we started working with a, vet, a veterinary behaviorist and had started with the medications and through the next two and a half years, we tried many, many medications. And when she finally did pass, she was on a cocktail of three different medications. And they worked. It was interesting with her. The meds would work for a while, and then they seemed to lose their effectiveness. We would try some different meds, up the dosage, and we just never hit on anything that was um, really great working for her and that allowed her to have a good quality of life. So at five and a half years of age, we made the decision that um, that it was time. It was time. Our lives had become such that everything that we did revolved around making sure that Elka was okay, that Gibbs was safe, and we were basically one management failure away from a disaster. And I can remember talking to a trainer friend two years ago who had gone through behavior euthanasia herself with one of her dogs, and it was a traumatic event where another dog got killed. And the comment was made, you know, why do we wait? Why do we wait until there's a horribly traumatic event to, to have the euthanasia for a dog? And I just knew for Elka that her quality of life was so, so poor. At this, By the time this happened in December, um, she was spending most of her days in my closet, underneath my clothes. Um, sometimes we would feed her in there. Sometimes she would come out and if we went outside, she'd go outside sometimes, go out to do her business and come right back in. Occasionally she'd be happy going in the car, going somewhere. So her quality of life just, it really stunk. She was just hang, just hanging out. And it's one of those things in retrospect, when I look at photos of her now, because you don't see this stuff when you're in the thick of it. I look at all of her photos, worry lines in every single one. Even when I think, oh, she looks happy there. When I look back, I'm like, oh my God, that dog was just not comfortable and quite often scared. So um, at that point, we made, we did do a euthanasia. We were lucky enough that we have um, a couple veterinary people in town who will come to the home. We were able to do it in the home, and it was as peaceful as it could be. We didn't have a bad um, a bad experience with the euthanasia, but man, this has by far been one of the most the, one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. And I, I kind of equated everything to. Um, Going through the experience, when you live with a dog who has all these behavior issues and a diminished quality of life, it's almost like taking care of someone who is in the end of life. And I, I'm saying this because as a, as a nurse, I've done that many times, taking care of folks who are dying, taking care of family members who are dying. And you become so involved in making sure that everything's okay for them that you forget about the other animals and you forget about your family. You forget about how to live and how to live in um, a way that's comfortable and happy for you as well. So the whole family is is impacted when you have a dog whose quality of life stinks and a dog who has horrible behavior issues. So we did make the decision to do it before we had a traumatic event where another person, because, you know, in addition to all of this, Elka was reactive to other dogs, people, chase cars, all of that. She just, you know, you run down the checklist of things that our clients call us about. Elka checked off just about every box for things that we that we get called about. Um, and since 
having done the euthanasia. And this is the part that I really want to talk to everybody um, about how to take care of yourself as a professional. Because what I found for myself was that I really struggled and I have been struggling since it happened. And I finally, a month and a half ago, um, reached out for help from a professional counselor and I am now taking medication, antidepressants. And it's been really, really helpful to, to do that. And yeah, for me, I struggled to even do it because I'm a nurse practitioner. I talk to people about this stuff all the time in my career. I had a 30-year career at that. And I'm a dog professional. And I have friends like Trish and other friends that are my crew of training buddies that I could talk to. And even at that, I was still really, really struggling. So just know that it's okay. It's okay. The struggle is real and it's okay to get help for it. And I think I'm going to stop for there for a second. <laughs> now, one, of, one of the things that um, Sue Alexander and I offer for people who are going through this type of grief, it's a really specific and unusual and difficult type of grief. Um, we have a support group called Losing Lulu. I'm sure many of the members have heard of it. And what has struck me just listening to Joanne's tale now um, is you've had all this support and so many people have had to deal with a behavioral euthanasia without any support. We've had people tell their stories who have euthanized a dog 30 years ago, one person euthanized 50 years ago, and has been carrying this like a stone in their chest, this knowledge that they had ended the life of a companion animal. That's not why we go into having companion animals. We, we never expect to have to do this. But at the same time, it, it is a kindness in some ways. And one of the things we try to do on Losing Lulu is let people know that setting a dog free, and Alka was in both physical and mental pain, setting them free of, of those um, problems that they have is a gift that we can give sure. to our animals. Yeah. And, and for me, um, this is something I have not talked about this publicly. You know, I when I posted on Facebook, all I put was the date of her birth or the year of birth and the year of death and said, we just said goodbye to Alka today. So I'm basically launching myself out of a very <laughs> safe bubble by doing this, but we need to talk about it. We just need to, um, to normalize it and make it okay for people, just to let people know it's going to be okay. And it's okay to make those tough decisions. I think it is something that needs to be normalized so that people can talk about it and share their experience more. I think that's a great point that Trish brings up about um, you, 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 Joanne, do have a lot of supports. And even with those supports, it's still just been, you know, so difficult to, to go through and rightly so, but a lot of folks don't have that support. So I think it's good to talk about and thinking about normalizing it as you were talking um, and you were talking about how the whole family is impacted you know, and including the individual who everybody is centered around, who their lives are impacted, you know, everybody is impacted by it. And you said you you don't see it like when you're in the thick of it. And both both of those things made me think of physical health. And the, the <laughs> did you, you, <laughs> you think so, too? I see you nodding there. You, Abs nope. ab yes, absolutely. You know, it's one of those um, you go through after they're gone, you go through the periods of, oh, my God gosh, this is such a huge sense of relief. And from a physical standpoint, I'm actually sleeping, even though, you know, there's some depression in there, but I'm sleeping better. Therefore, I am healthier. And when you don't have, we know it with dogs, when we, when, with us too, when we don't have that worry, our physical bodies are able to be just more stable. For sure, for sure. And I think that's a hallmark of this type of grief is you are grieving and you are relieved that you can go back to having a normal life. And then you feel guilty that you're feeling relieved about this very difficult decision you've had to make. And it, it's really such an unusual, it's so different from losing a dog to old age. The feelings that um, I've been experiencing are some of the most intense I've ever experienced. And it's even more so than when I lost my parents, which is so freaky to me. I, as a nurse and nurse practitioner, I've always looked at the grief process as something um, just kind of from the outside to see where it takes me. 
and just let myself, allow myself to feel what I'm going to feel. And it's just been so interesting to me that it's, um, the feelings are more intense, really more intense. And then you also have that, you know, the sense of guilt because you are a professional and you should know how to do this. And I will tell you, this is one of my favorite things when I met with the counselor about a month ago, a month and a half ago, within three minutes of speaking to me, she she said to me, so you need to forgive yourself for not walking on water. <laughs> I was like, okay, you cut right through to it. But yeah, <laughs> that's what we're all feeling here. Well, that's the thing with behavioral euthanasia is when you go public with it, yeah. and, and I commend Joanne for doing this every time a professional trainer says, yeah, I've been through this too. It helps us with our clients and it helps the people who are listening in who have been keeping this quiet for their entire lives. Um, I, I think this is, I think it's really brave of you to come forward and. Thank you. And you know, Trish, my husband for a lot, cause I wanted to write about this as soon as it happened. And he literally sat in my office and put his hand on my keyboard and said, no, don't do this. I, first off, he didn't want me to do it ever. And we came, to, <laughs> we came to a compromise as you do in marriage. And I waited six months and I, he was, he was actually very right. It, doing it right um, right after would not have been the right time. It would have been too reactive for me. And I, I just wasn't in the right headspace where I could take it, take whatever's going to come my way. Cause you know, I know something's going to come my way and, and I'm, I'm okay with that now because I feel very, very strongly um, that we need to talk about it and we need to support each other as trainers and we need to be able to support um, our clients as well and let our clients talk about it. And there's no other kind of loss where you get bullied. Like you've just yeah. gone through the hardest day of your entire life for many of us. And then you get second guessed and they're like, well, why didn't you try this? Why didn't you do hip surgery? Why didn't you do... There's, there is no such thing as trying everything. And, and one thing that we say over and over on Lulu is you have done everything that was reasonable for you. And what is reasonable for a family with three little toddlers is different from what's reasonable for me living on a farm by myself, which is different for, from Joanne living with a husband and another dog. All of our all of our levels of doing enough, it's going to be different. And, and it's okay. Like you, you did everything that was reasonable for you. And you did not wait for that blood donation. You did not wait for that losing your dog on a no good, really bad day where, you know, there's been injuries, where there's been explosions, where there's, I, I think it's a real gift to be able to let them go on a good day and have good memories of that last, those last moments. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's almost in that aspect, it was almost a bit like when you have an older dog that, you know, the time is coming. We were able to let her do everything she loved to do on her last days, eat all the last two days, let her eat everything. You know, she went to her favorite. She did have one place where she was content. She would go to our pet sitter's farm and run, swim, do all those things. So she got an extra long day of doing that. So yeah, there and there there is when you can plan it a bit because it's always unexpected. I think it's never uh, I'm going to do this in three months. It's just kind of but to the best of your ability, it was nice to be able to give her all of her nice things before she did die. Yeah, and and with my own personal dog who I euthanized, I I did let him go on a no good, very bad day. I had a euthanasia planned out. We did all the good things, and as often happens when you take all pressure off, you his behavior got a lot better. And I'm like, well, that's a sign. We've got to try more things with him. And what ended up happening was a few weeks later, we had a really no good, very bad day where um, my last memories of him were of him in great distress, of me and the boyfriend I, who was co-owner of him at the same time in great distress. We had to go to a vet that we didn't know. It was a big rush. He was muzzled. He was stressed. And if we had gone through with it as planned, it would have been a much better memory. That's that's the memory that I get to carry. And I think, I think doing what you did for Elka was the kinder thing for you and your husband as well. And it sounds like it was the kinder thing for Elka too. Um, it I, everybody's story is different. I know, and just like Trish was saying, every um, 
uh, on losing Lulu, I believe you said something about um, you did everything that was reasonable for you to do, you know, and that will be different for everybody. But in, in your case, you know, hearing you talk about Elka living in the closet and feeding her some days in the closet and things like that, um, it seems like to give her a, a beautiful, you know, those beautiful days doing things that she could do and love doing was was a kindness for her as well. Yes. Th- and thank you. It sure, it sure was. And it, you know, it, it makes, um, it, it makes you feel a little better that you can, you can give them that last little gift of, of nice things that they do enjoy, enjoy doing for sure. And one, of, one of the things that I always think about after the fact is how much easier we make the life for the other animals or the other beings in the household, the children, the husband, whoever else is sharing life. It's not just us as the trainers living with the dog or the person who is the primary trainer. I always think, you know, my duty is to the animals I have now. And if I bring in an animal who is causing them distress, um, the, the ones who are here who didn't do anything wrong, we've got to consider their quality of life as well. And Joanne was telling me a while ago about how Gibbs has changed. And I know he was he, he is not a dog without behavior problems either. And I wonder how much of what he was suffering for a lot of his life was Elka related. Oh, for sure. So Gibbs is um, our nine-year-old standard poodle who, um, yes, he had horrible reactivity issues. And since... Elka has been gone. He is like, he's a different dog. He's playing with toys again. He's so much more relaxed. And from a behavior standpoint, it's so much easier to take him places. And we are taking him more places and he's enjoying it. It's not like it's a... um it's it's torture for him. Of course, the treat pouch is still on and lots of <laughs> treats are coming out, but he's he's more relaxed. He's calmer. He can he's just having he's just having fun. Well, he's everybody's, enjoying life now. Everybody's life gets smaller when you have a dog with a severe behavior problem. It's not just that particular dog living in the closet. It's every like going on vacation is difficult. Having people over is difficult. Like you don't really realize how many steps you are taking, twisting yourself into a pretzel for, and and I've I've done it for dogs I didn't euthanize for behavior as well, but you know the the other beings in your household deserve to have a good life too, and they weren't the ones with the problem, right? And, and you know, um, for my husband too, life is just calmer for him. He he loves our animals and um he's come he's made great strides in training thanks to trish <laughs> <laughs> but still it was very difficult for him because he didn't un- he didn't always understand what she was experiencing and it's just, it's very hard when you just want it to stop and it doesn't stop it doesn't stop and you you know it's it's just very difficult on a person who doesn't have the level of keen interest in behavior and figuring out everything like we all do um, to live with that. It's not it's not a, a good choice for them. So his life is is much nicer. To, his life is much nicer too. He and Gibbs, as a matter of fact, they're sitting out on our back deck right now, enjoying life. <laughs> Well, Joanne, I want to thank you. Um, Like Trish said, this is a super brave thing to do to um, be so vulnerable to come on a a podcast and share share this story um, with us. And and I hope that you don't get any kind of negativity over it, you know, but um, we, we all know that's unfortunately a possibility. And so I appreciate your braveness in in doing this in order to hopefully help somebody else. Um, if, you know, I, I, I don't want to stop talking about your, your story. If there are things, you know, that you want to share about as we continue talking, um, please do. But I know we have both of you, uh, behavior professionals with us on the show. And I would like to talk a little bit now, if you all are okay with it about, um, how we deal with behavioral euthanasia as behavioral professionals. And so I know that both of you have experience in working with clients as they work through coming to um, terms with either making the decision to euthanize or not euthanize over behavior issues. And then Trish, I know you also have experience working with shelters and rescues on these issues as well. And so I wonder if we could talk a little bit now about uh, some of the things that you can 
consider when you're helping somebody else working through the process in deciding if behavioral euthanasia is some, you know, a direction they need to go in or maybe how you bring that topic up if um, it's something that somebody hasn't considered but might need to be at least discussed for safety issues. Does that maybe, Trish, do you maybe want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, This could actually be for podcasts. Sue and I teach a course on talking to clients about behavioral euthanasia a couple times a year. Um, But in essence, I'm never going to say you should euthanize that dog. That is not a word that should, or a set of words that should ever come out of any behavior consultant's mouth. It is not up to us. If they want to manage, if they want to train, if they want to work with that dog forever, that's fine. But that being said, sometimes they're coming to us for permission to euthanize. Or sometimes they don't know that that is a possibility. So just laying it on the table, <laughs> the Doberman squeaking things, apologies for animal noises in the background. Um, so I just lay it on the table. So we have a lot of choices with this animal who has severe behavior problems. We can continue training. We can manage. We can surrender back to the breeder, back to the shelter. Some people have a delusion that there's a sanctuary out there for all of the aggressive animals or the anxious animals. There is not. <laughs> um, or we could euthanize. And I just lay it on the table like, like a set of cards. Here are the things that we can do. And it's up to you to choose how to shuffle that deck, which of them. And of course, there's also referring out, referring up, sending to a vet behaviorist. But those are kind of, that still falls into the sort of train, manage side of the equation. So I just lay it all on the table. And sometimes they, they're shocked when I put behavioral euthanasia on the table. And I'll often say it in a way like many people in your situation would choose to euthanize an animal who is suffering this this much behaviorally. And it's not like you should do this, but many people do this. It is, and I'll also say it is not the wrong decision if you decide to go down that route. And then I usually walk away from it and talk about other things and wait for them to to bring it back. And if they do, then we'll go through logistics. We'll go through, you know, should we go to the veterinarian? I had one client euthanize her um, dog on my farm because the dog was very dangerous at the veterinarians, but loved coming to my farm. So, and sometimes a client will, be a shocked and appalled and that will never happen and I will if I have to move to an island and the dog has to be crated and muzzled all day every day I can't do that and that's their choice it's their animal so we need to we need to let them choose and we need to respect their choice yeah I I agree with that and I, I kind of do the same thing as Trish does just bring up all the options and try and do it as kindly um and as just stating the facts while being empathetic with their situation. And then I do the exact same thing. I just say, this is what the choices are. This is what you can think about. And then I I leave it as well and see what circles back to me, whether they want to talk about it or not. And then I just leave it and help. I try to do my best to help them with whatever decision they have chosen to make. Yeah. And working in the separation anxiety field, I know that's an especially tough one because for me, I have had to make that call in shelters occasionally and honestly those are the hardest ones for me because the dogs are only suffering because they love us too much like they're often the wiggliest friendliest sweetest dogs but I do think there is a degree of suffering that is suffering too much the daycare I used to work at had a dog who went through a second story plate glass window trying to get to his owner's hurt himself badly luckily did not get off the roof of the um, I think it was on the roof of the porch he didn't jump all the way down but If they're injuring themselves, I I do think there is a level of anxiety that is too much. Like we we often think, oh, it's only for aggression. It's only dogs who bite people or only dogs who bite people and other animals. But there are many reasons that an animal might be suffering mentally and it's okay to relieve them of that suffering. It it sure is. And I think um, taking it back to Elka, a lot of it came down to quality of life. And she had no quality of life. And it just, it, it just wasn't fair to let her, in my mind, and this is just me, in my mind, it wasn't fair in my mind to let her continue to suffer 23 out of 24 hours of the day. That's just, that's just not, it's just not right. And we have the power 
and the ability to make that choice to help them and give them give them freedom, as you said before, Trish. Trish, I wonder if I know you've worked a lot with shelters and rescues as well. And does um, the way that you work with staff and volunteers, people in those settings, does that differ from the way that you work with clients when you're thinking about behavioral euthanasia and helping them through that process? Yeah, I I think the bar has to be a little bit different with an animal who doesn't come with an owner. If we've got an Elka who has Joanne and her husband and a team of professionals behind them and the willingness to work, and you worked with her for many years, that is a whole different animal than if you had brought Elka to my shelter and said, here are all of her issues. And I have to find somebody, like if she was too much for you to deal with as a professional who's had her since she was a very young dog, how can I find somebody who doesn't know her who's like, I, I'm here for a five-year-old dog who has all of these problems. I would like to have a lot of medical expenses. I'd like to have a lot of behavioral expenses. <laughs> I'm going to have to move that toy. Um, but the bar has to be different for an unknown dog. And the other thing is the people who you are going to talk to in the shelter. I was director of animal behavior at the ASPCA shelter in Manhattan, which has had some very difficult dogs. We did have to make behavioral euthanasia decisions fairly frequently. And one of the things I did was I talked to the staff and the volunteers. I had an open door policy. We had a set time where people could come and discuss behavioral euthanasias with me. So I got very good at explaining why we don't adopt out dogs with these problems. And one of the stories that I told frequently was my epiphany as a new shelter person in the 90s, because I went into it with all of the no-kill fervor, just every, there's a lid for every pot, there's a home for every dog, there's a hermit in the mountains who wants every one of these, and I outsourced a lot of our shelter's euthanasia, behavioral euthanasia in the beginning, and I was just a volunteer, but I would be parading up and down if they tried to, that's how I got into Dobermans, I took one of the Dobermans off the euthanasia list, and um, got to experience life with her for 10 years. Um, Can I just interrupt you with a question for a second? When you say outsourced behavioral euthanasia, um, I I take that to mean um, uh, there's an animal who the... um, reasonable answer for public safety is probably or for that animal's own health is probably behavioral euthanasia. But um, by not making the choice, somebody else maybe has to make the choice. Yeah, that- yeah. And let, let me tell you the story of the dog who changed my mind on that. So one of the things when I started in sheltering was many of my friends were also single with no pets and no kids. So exactly what you look for when you're looking for that unicorn home. So Rosie was a dog that I fell for in the shelter. She was a beautiful young dog. She was adopted and brought back to us for growling at the owner. I'm like, well, that's no big deal. Let me pop her into foster. She'll be fine. I fostered her with my friends. And as planned, they adopted her. (laughs) And she was not an easy dog. There were things that I didn't know about her. And I, I should have kept her in the shelter long enough to find out. I knew she didn't love other dogs. That's why I was looking for an only dog home for her. But she was dangerous to other animals. So my friends, I got to do long-term follow-up with John and Mindy, who had this dog. And for four years, they paid every trainer in town, because I promptly moved to another town. They did all kinds of work with her. They had pet sitters who had to walk her on a muzzle. And during the four years they had her, she got into a few dog fights. She seriously injured John once, breaking up that dog fight. She killed three of the neighbor's cats, two of them in full view of the neighbors. She started stalking children in the same way she was stalking cats and dogs. And at this point, John and Mindy were trying to have a family. And on Rosie's last day, she was being walked by the pet sitter who forgot the muzzle at home. And a little dog was barking under his own gate at her. He's still in his yard. He's just got his head under the gate barking. And she grabbed that dog by the head, a little spaniel, pulled him under the gate with such force that the gate came off the hinges, shook him and nearly killed him. And that was the last straw for John. He sent me a a letter describing the incident, took her straight to the vet and had her euthanized. And I thought, the, the thing that occurred to me after that happened, he went and he bought a beautiful dog from a breeder. He never set foot in shelter again, neither did his wife. 
um, and I thought about all the people who had heard Rosie's story over those four years. They worked in the film business in Vancouver. They were very social people. They had large families and everybody heard about this really difficult dog they'd gotten from a shelter. So the thing that really got me was how many shelter animals had I euthanized inadvertently by sending out one really quite dangerous one. So my shelter got to have the clean slate and we did not put that in the euthanasia column for, for that month. But I put my friends through hell and I, innocent animals were killed. Um, innocent people were injured. Innocent animals were injured. And the dog ended up euthanized anyways with a lot more trauma than there would have been if I had been brave enough to do it from the start. Thank you for sharing that story. And yeah, I see where um, on, on one hand it was kind of outsourcing the euthanasia of that individual animal, but also, as you point out, um, likely influencing the euthanasia of others. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. I wonder if you could both talk a little bit now about what is important for behavior professionals to do. What kinds of things, I guess, can we as behavioral professionals do for ourselves to keep ourselves healthy, to keep ourselves well when we are encountering these kinds of um, just mentally and emotionally taxing issues like behavioral euthanasia, working with individuals or shelters? Are there things that we can do for our own mental health? Uh, for me, um, finding finding your crew, finding folks who are who know who know what you're going through, and have those people that you can reach out to. In addition to Trish, I'm a member of um, kind of a business group of six other trainers that we meet <clears throat> monthly via Zoom just to talk over cases, life, whatever's going on. And they were after Trish, they were the first people I reached out to and said, "Hey, this is what I'm going through." just think about me. And man, every single one of them sent me really nice emails, really nice texts. And they even sent me flowers after um, Elka was gone. And then just not being afraid to um, talk to your mental health professionals. And I'm going to go into nurse practitioner mode here a little bit. You can start with your primary care physician or your primary care nurse practitioner or PA. Start there find out who who you can talk to and it's different for ev in every state but you can also do a google search the way i found the lady i was talking to was i googled north carolina pet grief counselors and there was a lady who lo and behold is 2 hours from me we met via zoom so many mental health professionals meet via zoom now so you don't even have to go into anybody's office where it's even more uncomfortable you can do it from the safety of your home and just just talk to people don't be afraid um, to do it. And I'm here to tell you, it's really, really helpful and benefited me immensely. And reach out to your family and friends and everybody else. But I think having truly your crew of training people, cadre, um, that's, for me, that was the most helpful thing. How about you for, for you, Trish? Yeah, I think one of the things that we face in the shelter world is we are barraged by social media. And if you put something on social media. This is how Losing Lulu was formed. I had Lulu as a foster dog. Our group made the decision to euthanize her after she tore up my smaller dog. I'm glad it happened in my house and I had a break stick so I was able to release her grip before she actually killed my dog. And I knew once that happened, absolutely, that's, that's not a dog we can adopt out. And the rescue group that I I'm on the board of is 100% behind not sending dangerous dogs out to the public. And I just thought, thank God that didn't happen in somebody else's home at Thanksgiving when Aunt Betty arrived with her Pomeranian and let it go in the house. So, um, but I got a lot of slack, flack online. I had, I was called things I have not been called before and I've been <laughs> sheltering a long time. I'm not going to share the details with you. But my delete block game is really strong. <laughs> as soon as you hop on my social media, this is my living room. You do not get to come in and defecate in the middle of my living room. Delete block, delete block, delete block. The thing that I hope for the people who are being cruel online, I think this is a reflection of themselves. I try to remind myself, this is 
their issue. This is not my issue. And I honestly hope they never have to go through what I have gone through. I hope they don't have to watch their little dog being torn up by a foster dog or what what Joanne went through with Alkai. And I think a lot of these comments come from a place of ignorance. They just I, I had a poll, an informal poll on my Facebook page, which has like 5,000 friends, mostly animal professionals. And I said, if you once felt that behavioral euthanasia should never happen and you have changed your mind, what changed your mind? And I was hoping it would be like, I wrote up Rosie's article in an essay called The Perils of Placing Marginal Dogs, which you can find online. I was like, hopefully it'll be one of those, or you heard me speak at a conference, or you heard somebody else speak, or you heard Joanne on a podcast. Um, but almost 100% it was personal lived experience. And it's something that if you haven't lived through it's really hard to imagine. Well, I, I I can be your person, Trish, to tell you that I my mind was changed by being open and listening to other um, behavior professionals and other individuals share about their personal experiences. And I can't point to a single moment in time, um, but it, it wasn't, luckily, thankfully, so far, it wasn't changed through, you know, my own experience. So what you're doing is, and I just say that because what you're you're doing, what you're both doing is a valuable thing to do, and it is changing some people's minds for sure. Um, I'm going to ask you both in just a second here to share about uh, how people can get in touch with you, educational opportunities and services available for folks who maybe are going through behavioral euthanasia, whether on a personal level or working professionally with folks and um, are being impacted by that and need some need some help uh, as they uh, are going through these experiences. But before I do that, I just want to give you both a chance. To in is there anything that I haven't asked yet that you haven't had the opportunity to talk about yet that we haven't touched on yet that you would like to share before we start to wrap things up? I'd like to add a few more resources for shelter professionals. I think a lot of us are suffering from compassion fatigue, and I think knowing what compassion fatigue is and how to treat it in yourself and how to point it out in your coworkers and help them find the help that they need. I'm not going to go, that would be another great hour for your podcast. Um, I'll often send shelter managers to Jessica Dolce's offerings. She's got some really good stuff. Some of it is free online. She also does um, consulting. And many employers have mental health help for people. And this is a hard thing. None of us go into sheltering thinking that we're going to be ending the lives of animals. We And we get painted as murderers if we do it, you know. It, it, so between social media coming at you from one side and us going in with the desire to save all the animals, it's, you know, the, the caring, killing paradox. It's a really difficult place to be. And it's okay, as Joanne said, to reach out for help and recognize compassion fatigue and take steps to to prevent it in yourself. Okay, take your vacations, take your time off, have interests outside of the shelter, have a way to decompress. It's, it's so important. And have your crew in the shelter world too. I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I agree with Trish. Jessica Dolce is just amazing. She's just a great resource for all of us. And if you're not a member of Losing Lulu, it's a great place um, to read and learn about both what professionals and pet parents are going through after they've euthanized a dog. Yeah, it's a, and it's it's not just for grief tourism. Like if you've got a client who's vaguely interested, don't give them losing Lulu. It's for people who have been through it, but we also welcome professionals. But you do have to answer the screening questions coherently. If you say, I heard Trisha and Joanne on a podcast, I am an animal behavior professional, our screener will let you straight in, um, but it's it's not a place to send just random clients because it's some really heavy reading. It's also some of the most interesting behavior histories you will ever see, and the insight it's given me into the minds of the people who go through this has made me even more adamant that we need to talk about this. We need to make it okay for shelters not to pass these on to um, people and, and not all of them come from shelters. Some of them come from great breeders, like crossed wires can happen in any animal of any species from any source. It's not just cat. It's not just dogs either. It's cats and horses. And we had a snake. We've had several rabbits, had a run of alpacas for a while. Um, any animal who has lost their life because of their own behavior, their guardian is welcome to come and join Losing Lulu and 
we have a culture of kindness there. We do not allow second guessing or shaming or blaming and we moderate very tightly. And so it, it is truly a safe place to come and read other people's stories and talk about your own if, if you choose to. Okay, and we'll try to link to the Losing Lulu URL, hopefully. Um, we'll be able to do that in the show notes. Uh, Trish, are there other educational opportunities or support services or your in your professional services? Um, where can folks go to find out about those kinds of things? Yeah, I, I offer online Zoom consulting. If you have a client that you don't feel you are ready to have that discussion with, you can refer them to me because I am very comfortable laying out all of the options. Um, Sue Alexander and I teach twice a year the Talking to Clients about Behavioral Euthanasia four-week course, where if you've never had to have this discussion, it's a really good place to go. And if you take the Shelter Dog Behavior Mentorship, there's a few courses on Shelter Behavior Hub. There's an introduction to behavioral euthanasia. There is a two-part um, series of webinars for clients if just on making the decision that they can watch at their own leisure. They don't have to sit down and watch all two hours. They can watch 15 minutes and go do something else. But we have a lot of resources in that way. So Shelter Behavior Hub is for the webinars and for the Shelter Dog Behavior Mentorship. We spend a whole week talking about setting criteria, writing an SOP for your shelter, deciding what an adoptable dog looks like before that dog is sitting in front of you staring in their eyes because it's a lot harder to make that decision when Rosie's looking at you with her big brown eyes. But if you say we do not adopt out dogs who, if you drop the leash, are going to cross the road and try to kill someone else's dog, like if we'd had that as a written policy, we would never have adopted her out. And Joanne, for people who would like to get in touch with you, find out about different services sure. that you have to offer. Yep. So they can find me at the looseleashacademy.com. Um, of course, I do separation anxiety work and that's all remote. So we take care of people and clients all, all around the world. And we do have a workshop coming up in September with Mike Shikashio and Chris Pockle. And it's the Great Big Dog Aggression Workshop Part 2, Meds, Moods, and Modification. Thank you, Mike, for that nice long title. Could you <laughs> repeat that really quickly? No. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pull it up on my website to make sure I got it right. <laughs> Thank you. Anyways, it's Michael Shikashio and Chris Paco September, in September here in Asheville, North Carolina. And then fingers crossed next May, um, Trish will be doing a workshop with Amy Cook. It's going to be fantastic. We're narrowing down what the workshop's going to be about, but it'll be in person in Asheville next May. I know it's going to be great. <laughs> We're a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You asked me if I was going to any conferences this Come year on. earlier, Joanne, and I said no, but maybe next <laughs> May I will go Come. to something. It's beautiful <laughs> here in Asheville. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank both of you so much for your braveness and your vulnerability to come on and share your personal stories, um, your your personal stories as, as owners and also your personal stories as professionals and um, working with folks going through this. Um, I and, and I just want to say again that you are making a difference in doing so and you are changing lives. So from myself, on behalf of the ATA community and on behalf of everybody listening today. Thank you both very much. Thank you very much for having us, Shelley. And thank you for allowing us to talk about, um, talk about the topic. Such an important topic. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again for having us. Yeah. And thank you for trusting me and trusting this um, platform to be somewhere to share about it. So thank you both. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.